Welcome, everyone. I'm Elaine Congress. I'm the Associate, Associate Dean and, and Professor at Fordham University Graduate School of Social Service. And I'm, I'm co-chair of the Institute, Fordham Institute for Women and Girls. And we're really pleased to put on this, uh, this conference uh, on, on small actions lead to huge solutions in reducing poverty for women and girls. Um, I, I want to tell you first, I'll tell you a little bit about the Fordham Institute for Women and Girls. We've been in business for over 20 years. We started in 2001, and we, we really work to promote gender equality by addressing all forms of discrimination against women and girls. And we do this both locally as well as globally, and you'll see this in, in, in our conference. Um, we, we are involved in doing education, research, and practice and, and, and to promote gender e equality. Um, we're open to everyone. We have faculty, we have students, we have practitioners, um, anyone who would like to join us. And, and that includes men as well. We're not just for women. Men can also join us. Um, some of our recent activities include conferences and also a newsletter, and I hope you all will, will uh, have a chance to look at our newsletter. Um, the two conferences we did um, is, we the first one we did this year in November was Closing the Digital Divide, and one of our students, uh, Frankie Heppel, kind of chaired that. And, and now we're going to do a very exciting conference, and this one is you know, entitled in, in Small Actions, Use Solutions and, and, re, and Addressing Poverty for Women and Girls. And this also, we're, we're fortunate that we've always had the conference in March, which coincides with a major event at the, at the United Nations, uh, the, the uh, Commission on the Status of Women. It's a two-week event. And this year, we're, we're at an official parallel event for for this conference, and so so uh, so we also will have people who are attending who are attending this this uh, event because they know about it because it's a parallel event at at, at the UN. Uh, uh, our conference is planned by many many people, and I want to just kind of introduce you to our team. Um, for first, then um, our co-chair Sam. Sandy Turner, and you'll hear from her shortly, and she'll introduce our first speaker. Um, also, other people, Pat Brunel is here. Pat, Pat is a past chair of, of our Florida Institute for Women and Girls, and she also is the kind of advisor for, for, our, for our publication, for our, new, for our newsletter. And, and also, we have Kristen Triglia, and Kristen is our, like a, an IT expert who's jo joined and been very active on our committee. Um, we have a number of student um, students who work on our committee. But first, I especially want to introduce, introduce Bernice and Lassalle, who are students this year at the UN with me. And they're in charge of organizing this conference. And they've both done a ter terrific job. And I know you've received many emails from both of them in, in terms of setting up and organizing this conference. Uh, other people who've worked on it have been Frank, Frankie Heppel and Rachel uh, Gentile. And, and of course, we have Liliana Otero, who is uh, the, the, uh, all, the author, the editor of our newsletter. Uh, now, I also wanna give special thanks to the IT team that's made this possible for us today. Bruce Fish Rodriguez, <laughs> who I uh, really it, it kind of off manager in charge of all that. And she's really made this possible for us. Other people of, of the IT team, we have Connor White, communications, a real expert, and Matt Roach, who is really helping us kind of doing doing the kind of the nitty gritty IT for this event. That's a, that's a little bit about, you know, things, but let's go on. And now I want you to hear from from the from the co-chair, uh, Sandy Turner. Sandy, you're on. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Welcome to our conference. Um, as Elaine said, we've been Women and Girls Institute. We were initiated. We had our first uh, meetings and and programs starting in 1993. So we've been we've been around for for a long time, and uh, we're going strong. Uh, we're really pleased about that. 
Um, this year, for the first time, we're able to offer CE credits for those of you who are eligible. And I just want to tell you, if you um, have signed up for CE credits, the only thing you need to do is stay for the whole conference. Um, make sure that your your name and when you and make sure we're going to put the evaluation in the chat. At, toward the end of the conference. So just make sure that you look for that and, and fill it out. And um, you can, yeah, you can send it back to me, um, sturner at fordham.edu. That would be great. And then we'll make sure that you get your um, CE. Your, it's two credits we're, being, we're able to offer. So, um, and then also as the conference goes on, if you um, have any questions, please put them in the chat and we, um, we save time at the end, and so we'll be able to address all of your questions um, at the end of the conference. Um, so just put them in the chat as you think of them, and we'll be we'll be looking for them. Okay, now I'm really pleased to introduce Edward Brewer, who um, is a creative force from Johannesburg, South Africa, who has a background in fashion, film, UX design, and his passion is to leverage technology for positive social support. One of his primary projects is the Women of the Golden Thread, which you will see in a minute. This is a groundbreaking initiative to empower women across Africa for using a mobile app that provides essential information, resources, and a supportive community, which addresses issues such as gender-based uh, gender violence. Edward's vision extends beyond this app as he envisions a world where technology serves as a catalyst for empowering women to achieve a more equitable and inclusive future. We are very honored to have, we consider Edward now as part of our team, our permanent team, and we, we are very honored to have him as part of the Women and Girls Institute. So now I'd like to turn the program over to Edward Brewer. Thank you. Can small actions lead to big impact? Hi, my name is Edward and I'm from Miami. Today we are exploring the transformative stories of three NGOs that are making a real significant change in their communities. Welcome to Small Actions Huge Solutions. Our first story comes from Breakline South Africa providing infrastructure for education and growth. For Breadline, every child matters. Let's see how Breadline is making a difference in their community. Our brains develop most in the first six years. Hungry for knowledge, absorbing information and experiences. In South Africa, only 30% of children have access to stimulating early learning environments. Most will not be school ready. When I grow up, I want to be a firefighter, a doctor, a doctor. Breadline Africa was established in 1993 originally as the international fundraising arm of Catholic Welfare and Development. Funds raised supported community upliftment projects, first in the Western Cape, then throughout South Africa and even beyond its borders. By 1997, we were providing a wide range of converted shipping containers from clinics to soup kitchens, startups, to community centers. More and more, we realize the urgent need for educational infrastructure in impoverished communities like classrooms and toilets, kitchens and libraries. Redline Africa's core focus is on providing infrastructure and initiatives to support early childhood development. So that includes providing safe spaces for children to learn in, and also initiatives such as taking children to the seaside once a year, which creates lasting memories and a hope for a better future. In 2015, we renewed our branding, unveiling the colorful logo we see today that serves as a constant reminder to keep the child at the center of our work. We believe that every child 
has the capacity to do something amazing with his or her life. When a child's imagination is unlocked, possibilities are opened up, allowing them to choose a path for their own future. So we're celebrating 30 years of Redline Africa this year, and there have been many remarkable milestones and achievements that we are incredibly proud of that we couldn't do without the support of like-minded individuals and donors. By our 30th year, we had delivered more than a thousand infrastructure units, supported more than 250,000 children, and provided more than four and a half million meals to children in need. We launched our most ambitious project to date to raise 156 million rand to replace 4,000 unsafe bed toilets in 240 South African schools, improving the lives of 120,000 children. There are still hundreds, possibly thousands of schools that are still using pit toilets. What one doesn't actually realize is how many children are really scared of going to use those pit toilets. A child that is too scared to go to the toilet, it shouldn't happen. Something needs to change. Today, we ask one important question before embarking on any intervention. Will this have the greatest measurable impact on the children? And of course, the answer must be yes. It makes you feel that they, as a human, you're actually making a difference and not just you. There's a whole army behind you, there's your colleagues, there's the donors, there's ordinary people that give to Breedline Africa. That's actually making that difference, you know, to communities like that. Breedline Africa, celebrating 30 years of changing lives. Amazing work indeed. Now let's turn our attention to Mameza Shark Crime Prevention. Mameza empower communities through safety technology. Let's learn more about their impactful journey. <laughs> The journey from victim to victor is a long and tedious one, and painful one, marked by anger, by shame, by pain, and the overwhelming desire for justice. He first ran the item at the gate, David Tony, at here, if una eco, langit, labas or sponsor corner, Uguti, em, sees a Susan's a campaign is in Fungi Seni about Isinto, Ezens Agala in Pagatini, Isn't Ezens Agala Eco, Langit. There's, we're still going to do a lot of things, a lot of programs. I need. So, Imameza, Imameza is about community safety. I need. We are all about community safety. So, what we do, we bring technology, the letter technology into the communities. 
Selecta e technology into the schools, and it so that Abantu Bagwas Gwenzani, Ugut Abantu Bagwas Guba safe, and it. We empower communities with early warning technologies, epenics, and camera technologies, and forge connections with response networks. With Memeza, we have just given epenic patterns to our local uh, community. We are here at our school to give uh, alarms to our students but also to install cameras for safety measures. You know, we, it's an unfortunate thing because our schools get vandalized. Most important equipment are stolen from our schools. Our school is a fairly old school with very, very high current statistics around here. Um, lots of burglary, um, lots of bullying. They've also given us um, uh, the alarm system so that our girl learners can be protected from bullying, uh, from acts of GBV. So you've got this personal alarm, right? The personal alarm is on We want you to protect yourself. When you feel like you are in danger, you need to protect yourself. This alarm is got a it's got a torch. You can use this as a key holder. We're gonna use this personal alarm as a shout. We are going to shout for help. I want you to pull this string and it's can you hear? So when you hear this sound, you must know who one of you is in danger. I need you are going to report. I need you. It starts with you. It starts with this sound to protect yourself. I need the personal alarm is going to be useful to me because I'm doing my trick and most of my papers I finish writing them at like around five and mostly it's a, it's dark. I'll be able to use it to alert people around me that I'm in danger or I feel threatened or feel like somebody is following me. Some of us walk from school to home, so on our way past home, do you have to pass ground and they're not safe. So it, it is easy for us when we have our memeza alert, we just pull it off, make sound, and then people will just be aware of what's happening at the current zone. When alarm systems are used, they have been proven to prevent crime by an impressive 60%. These buttons are integrated with state-of-the-art CCTV systems and integrated command center, creating a web of protection for our communities. They empower individuals to seek help swiftly, knowing that their call for assistance is heard and acted upon promptly. Welcome to our Memeza Monitoring Center. So this is where we monitor all schools. This is also where we receive panics, our alerts, so we create call-outs there, we, when we receive call-outs, and also if it's a positive intrusion, that is where we dispatch our securities and they provide assistance. I think it's going to alleviate some of the challenges that we used to face before. Memeza IT uh, equipments will help the school to be more safer than it used to be before. From bottom of my heart, I can express my feelings to say I feel proud, I feel very much confident in the programs. It will help me a lot by ensuring that I am safe. Even if the perpetrator cannot get me that easily. Even if they caught me hostage, the Memeza app will help me. The alarm system has not done much in the school. Uh, the one that we have, it's the one that was brought in by Memeza. It is really, really assisting us because they have installed cameras in the school. They have also installed the alarm system for the learners. Whenever they are over, they are facing challenges outside and they put that thing. Us at the school, they are notified together with the lo our local police station. So it has really done good for the school as well. Don't tell them at the school to make sure that our learners are safe, especially our girl child learners. These learners, they come in on weekends as well and on Saturdays. So whenever they come and do their practicals and to work in their workshops, they are feel safe and not vulnerable as learners. So our long term plan is to make sure that everyone is represented, even outside of the community, even the full search and go. For me, it's, it's looked like my is going to be a, a solution um, for the problem that we're facing by uh, not even just around here, but in South Africa as a whole. Security is the first thing in life, so I, don't, I, I know that uh, when you're around us, maybe it shows that even the perpetrators, once they heard that uh, there is Memeza around where we are, then I think even the perpetrators, they, they'll run away. It's our sincere hope that Davidson will witness a significant decrease in crime and GBV due to our collective efforts.
First Run Foundation's involvement goes beyond philanthropy. It is a testament to their belief in our shared vision to create safer, more secure communities for all. Thank you, First Rand, and I love you, and I'll keep on loving you so much. Keep it up, not for only Novena, but let's extend this program to other schools like uh, those who are in need or facing more challenges. Thank you so much. I can't wait to work with you. Thanks for First Rand for what they brought for us. Uh, we are very, 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 very happy. I'd like to thank the Mimeza team and the First Rand Empowerment Foundation for sponsoring us with personal alarms. Thank you, First Rand! What an amazing initiative. Now let's turn our attention to the Black Mermaid, Sandile Ndlovu's story. Sandile is changing the narrative of ocean conservation. Let's dive into her story. For me, it was always the story of the snake. When the water gets to your ankle, everybody's like, get out, that's enough water for you. We grow up with this fear that, that there's something in the water and at any point it could take you. We get on the boat, the boat goes out, we jump out onto the water and then I start freaking out. I'm drowning, I'm drowning, somebody save me, I am drowning. It's very difficult for us to give meaning to things that we don't understand, especially in the space of water. It's a question of how do we re-look at this whole narrative. My name is Zandi Lentlopu and I'm a 32-year-old from South Africa. So I grew up in Soweto, which is very far from the sea. Like a lot of us growing up, you know, we don't really come across the sea until that one trip that happens when you get closer to the ocean. The myths around the ocean growing up have always been about a big snake that takes little children. As the water pulls in, when the waves are crashing and pulling the water in, and if any of the kids didn't make it out, the snake took them. My grandmother will say, Umnumzan is out, and that means that the big snake is out and everyone must be careful. I mean, growing up as black young people was impossible. Like, a pool was daunting. A normal swimming pool was daunting. My whole life I've always felt like I don't fit in. Never finding home in the spaces where I was at. My corporate experience was, was interesting. It felt uncomfortable because there was a box. I didn't want to sit in the woman box. I, don't, I didn't want to sit in the black box. I didn't want to sit in any box. I just wanted to, I just wanted to live my heart out in the way that I've always lived my heart out. In 2016, I was going through a little bit of a hard time in my life. It was um, a little bit of a rattle at the end of my marriage. And I decided to go to Bali. I was riding my bicycle down to breakfast and I heard this guy saying, snorkel trip, snorkel trip. And I mean, I'd always wanted to go on a snorkel trip, but I just, it had never happened. And uh, so I signed up and the guy gave me my mask and snorkel fins and that was that and we jump out into the water. As I watched the dive master at the bottom of the ocean, I took out my snorkel and I dived down to the bottom and I was with him, picking up these shells and looking at him. And I'll never forget the feeling. There was this place that existed that was for me. I had never, never in my life been more at home.
And then I come across this video and I'll never forget it because I thought, what kind of witchery is this? These three girls are on the top of the water and they just dive in, right? And they're swimming along the reef. They don't have cylinders on their backs. And I just thought, what the hell is going on? So then I obviously go onto my laptop to find out what it is. And I found out that that was free diving. You dive into space and you're just by yourself and all that surrounds you is just a beauty and a peace like you've never known. And you're free from what is to come. You're free from what has happened. All there is is the now. The brain relaxes. It's not thinking about the many things that it does. There's nothing else that matters than that moment. The, the first in every single reaction is shock. You know, everyone will say, but that's white people stuff. But it's, it's accessible to everybody. And the idea that water sports have always been white sports is, is incorrect. And we have a responsibility to kind of change that. Becoming the first black freediving instructor is not an individual achievement. I think it's a country's achievement because it talks about uh, opportunity and access and the ability to dream even from where we come from. So I decided to start the Black Mermaid Foundation because one, there is a present fear when it comes to water when it comes to black and brown people. I wanted to create a safe space to have discussions and, and how does that open up opportunities? These are spaces that are largely untransformed in South Africa. The Black Mermaid Foundation was so much bigger than being a freediving instructor. It wasn't about that. It was saying, how do we go back and change the narrative and allow people to dream bigger? It's not just you know, about the freediving aspect. It's not just your work. It's how you show up everywhere. You just need to be present enough to realize, to just take a breath. The obstacles that I had to go over is, is a lot of mind stuff. Detaching from the fears of deep waters, detaching from the fear of the unknown, and somehow finding what it truly means to be present. Could the snake be there? I don't know, but what I what I am is is me and I'm here and all there is is the present. Free diving has taught me that the ocean is an alive creature and for me as I go into the waters, I arrive here not with fear, but with respect. These NGOs amplify the impact of empowering women and girls. Let's reflect on these stories and ask ourselves a question. What small actions can I take to empower those around me? Join us in supporting these NGOs. Visit their websites, give a like or donate. Together, we can make small actions lead to huge solutions. Thank you. Oops. You're, you're muted, Sammy. Thank you so much, Edward. Amazing videos. Um, wonderful work that's being done and in, in, in not with all these apps and, and teaching people not to be afraid of the water. It's, it's really wonderful. Thank you so much. So now um, let's see. Now our next speaker will be um, Pia. And I think Anise is going to introduce. Yes. Thanks. I am excited to present our next speaker as I was lucky enough to have heard her present last year. 
Dr. Pierre Rigarosi is a professor of global politics at the University of Southampton in the United Kingdom. And she's also co-director of the Global Health and Policy Center at that same institution. Pierre's research focuses on the political economy of development, human rights, and regional governance in Latin America. She is currently working on research projects regarding migration and gendered health inequalities in Latin America and securitization and humanitarian responses addressing displacement in Latin America. Pia is also principal investigator in the Economic and Social Research Council funded project redressing gendered health inequalities of displaced women and girls in context of protracted crisis in Central and South America, where she worked with the International Organization for Migration and Academic Policy and humanitarian agencies in the Global South. She has a few publications. Her most recent include Displacement, Health, Rights, and Sexual and Reproductive Health, and that's from the Bristol University Press. The second, the credibility of regional policy making, insights from South America. And lastly, she, her everyday political economy of human rights to health, dignity, and respect as an approach to gendered inequalities and accountability. I present you, Dr. Pia Rigorosi. It was. Well, thank you very much. Uh, uh, Lassen and, and Bernice, I have to say, thank you so much. And that's a really kind uh, introduction. It's an absolute pleasure to be here and actually hugely inspired, not only by the work that uh, you all are doing uh, at the Institute for Women and Girls and uh, for them in general, uh, which is hugely impressive, as I said, and I had the opportunity to be with you uh, last November. But the videos uh, that we just saw are uh, it, it, it are hugely uh, moving, but more than moving, it's moving forward. You know, not just moving in terms of. And I think that's one of the things that I want to rescue here when we talk about the things that we're going to be addressing for the uh, for the next uh, few um, minutes, for me, hours, perhaps uh, overall. Um, I think we need to re it, deconstruct a bit that idea of, of victims uh, that we tend to see in many uh, situations uh, related to, to women and girls in general. And I think there's a, an incredible amount of power and resilience and creativity and agency that we see uh, and that these videos that we just saw uh, proved and showed so clearly uh I, I i i wasn't about to it sound like this but i think we um as academics need to also ask you know who are the agents of change here and what is the role that we are playing to become somehow agents of change uh what can we do as academics to support that change to expand policy horizons to expand policy capacities what can, do, what can we do to create new spaces to represent uh, different voices and to allow, actually, um, different voices and representation? And I think the uh, Black Mermaid project that we just saw talks so nicely about something that I want to bring in my uh, conversation today, which is um, understanding those opportunities that women and girls have to um, to engage it and and to fulfill that self governance. To stop, you know, especially in humanitarian settings. Stop telling them what they need to do or what is good for them. Or I think we need to 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 have more voice and and spaces for uh, uh for 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 safe spaces, but also spaces for representation and voice. And as the, the main uh, leader of that a, a Black Mermaid um, uh, initiative, as she was saying, changing the narratives is really important. Uh, and I think that's one of the things that is moving me at, at this point in my work. You know, how, how do we see all the humanitarian work that is being done around women and girls uh, that is uh, that is over representing the idea of victims and women and girls and victims and that uh, I mean of course they are <laughs> of course there are many uh, circles and and, and inter um, 
connection of, of factors that are oppressive and are creating situations of vulnerability of all sorts and harms of all sorts. But what are the spaces that the, that these humanitarian settings create for self-governance, for, for autonomy, for self-determination? That is questionable. So, and I think this is a, a parallel uh, initiative or a parallel uh, conference to that of a UN looking and thinking and, 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 and reflecting on rights of women and girls. And I think one of the main things that are not working in the UN system in general is the humanitarianism that takes victims as the un uncle uh, and an and anchor for, uh, uh, for, for support, for aid, for... So I think we need more of these initiatives as we saw just now uh, and creating those spaces for, for self-governance, for autonomy, uh, for self-determination and so on. So uh, with that, uh, I, I now will turn to what I wanted to, to, to present today, which is a bit uh, uh, linked to, to these questions, but turns our focus to what 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 does protection should what should protection uh, look like you know we, we talk about protection and and moving beyond humanitarianism so what should we think about what is that that needs to be done so um this is not a minor uh, question and these are not minor issues because we are approaching the end of the road towards the deadline set in the 2030 agenda, the UN agenda uh, to achieve the sustainable development goals. Uh, and those goals are not looking okay in terms of the SDG five on gender equality and empowerment of all women and girls. So we have a problem uh, and we have uh, uh, clearly uh, a world that, stay, that is failing women and girls. We have currently one in 10 women living in extreme poverty. And if the trends continue, uh, there were uh, many studies uh, showing that uh, by 2030, uh, there will be 8% of the world's population of women uh, in extreme poverty. So that is telling us a, a lot about uh, uh, what's not working. Uh, and I think one of the issues is precisely the gap between the normative frameworks and what is being achieved on the ground. So turning the focus on Latin America, which is uh, uh, what, uh, what I, I, I work on uh, mainly, uh, we have that these issues are very pressing. We uh, know that gender inequalities uh, persist in Latin America uh, in several dimensions, education, employment, access to healthcare, access to quality of uh, uh, healthcare, issues of representation, political participation, and so on. And despite progress in some of these areas, uh, women are still vastly overrepresented in terms of lower paid uh, and more precarious jobs. Uh, we still see uh, women facing a uh, huge gender gaps in terms of wage, in terms of uh, opportunity for education, for 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 jobs as uh, decent jobs, uh, and of course there are high rates of gender based violence uh, that is reported across the region. Now, these issues are obviously important in themselves and in the societies that uh, I mentioned in the, across the, the, the region, Latin America, but also they are drivers of forced migration. This is something that I have a particular interest and in, I have been working on forced migration in, in Latin America to see... Um, and to identify the many gendered dimensions of forced migration that uh, are blind in many cases uh, in the humanitarian uh, setting, in the, in the humanitarian aid and, and programs. Um, we uh, know that uh, half of the almost 73 or 4 million migrants in the Americas are women and adolescent uh, and, and girls. 
uh, that's nearly 50 percent that's a lot that's a, that's very gendered in itself uh, but also the reasons for these women and girls fleeing uh, their countries and we have seen this trend um, uh, from the Venezuelan uh, women uh, are gender related uh, and, and and this is important to understand because because of the data itself, we know that uh, according to Amnesty International, uh, uh, at the time when the Venezuelan migration started to uh, increase uh, enormously in terms of the flows in 2014, 15, 16, at that point, uh, there was 65% increase in maternal mortality. So that is a very indicative context in which women, many women, not facing uh, uh, healthcare opportunities, uh, lacking uh, basic medical tools, equipment, personnel, and all those things that affected the health system, uh, were forced to flee. Uh, and, and almost uh, most of them actually went to uh, neighboring countries. Now, you sat in, in New York and know this very well, and New York has uh, really good policies around uh, sheltering and, 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 and so on, but we still know that the situation of the Venezuelan migrant women and girls uh, crossing uh, to arrive in, in, in the US uh, are deteriorating and are creating um, serious questions mark at, uh, around uh, uh, responsibility to protect. Um, I want to uh, also highlight that this is part of a study that we have been doing where the three main reasons why Venezuelan migra uh, migrant women and, and girls uh, fled was uh, related to 10% um, uh, were pregnant, so that's already a significant amount, but the reasons were obtaining food, and I know that there's going to be a talk about food insecurity later on, and, and this is a really important aspect uh, of uh, migration, not just uh, on the Venezuelan uh, migrants, but in general. Uh, and 38% uh, were uh, in mentioning issues of access to health treatment, while 30% issues of gender-based violence. Those reasons, hunger, uh, healthcare, and gender-based violence are pushing women to leave their countries. And it's the same or similar uh, in Central America where extortion and gender-based violence uh, mean that many women and girls are uh, leaving um, forcibly uh, their their countries. So this point, uh, and this is my, my, my first big point, uh, kind of a take home uh, point, is uh, that uh, forced migration is a phenomenon that is preceded by the violation of human rights and is uh, gender. Uh, and we need to understand it uh, like that. We need to understand the gender dimensions of forced migration because that will lead to understanding and discussing um, uh, 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 seriously what gender responsive protection should look like. So um, I mentioned the reasons uh, and, 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 and why women and girls uh, are leaving, but we also know that on the way these uh, vulnerabilities are um, uh, are even higher. Uh, transit is something that is affecting uh, in terms of uh, vulnerabilities and, and situations of, of insecurity in ways that are uh, serious, very, very serious. And of course, we know that crossing borders can also be biased due to uh, precarity or high militarization in some places or lack of institutional presence. Uh, that all that increases situations of uh, violence, human trafficking, uh, uh, etc. So the point is that we need to understand gender dimensions of, 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 of migration or displacement and gender dimensions of protection. What is a gender responsive protection for women and girls? Um, the second uh, point just before coming to, to, to an end uh, would be um, understanding that uh, the harms or, or, or any solution and any protection system uh, that takes the, the gender aspect at, at the center, we have to redress uh, the harms of forced migration. 
Um, the harms are uh, that affect women and girls, as we said, uh, and or we at least mentioned uh, at passing, uh, relate to the loss of control over their bodies, uh, the bodily harm that they suffer, uh, the lack uh, or, or the loss of uh, uh, private spaces, the loss of, 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 of belonging, deprivation of all sorts, loss of control of future plans, uh, loss of their homes, the home environment, loss of status uh, that affect jobs, livelihood, uh, the social status, that affect their identity, that affect, uh, affect agency, and the loss of health. And this is uh, the point that, that you are more interested uh, uh, about, and is the loss of health and well-being, damage of health, uh, physical health, and damage of health, mental health resulting from the combination of all the losses uh, above uh, mentioned and uh, the exacerbated uh, violences that we uh, see. So to finalize my 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 claims here, the question is well, who, who should care? <laughs> who, whose responsibility to protect protect this is? Um, and that's a tricky one because uh, and goes all the way back to my first uh, claim, which is the international normative frameworks, including the global compact for migration and refugees are not working to in, in terms of giving solutions that protect women in relation to their self or opportunity for self-governance and creating uh, autonomy and creating opportunities for self-determination. If anything, they, they are directing some, some of the humanitarian actions that we see, but they are far from building durable solutions. Um, uh, but but the responsibility is not just of the international and humanitarian actors, nor is the one single state responsibility. This has to be grounded in a broader understanding of shared responsibility uh, because the international legal frameworks are not enough, because the state focus is not enough, and because we need a gender lens on protection that brings different actors uh, the institutional, inter social, intersectional, or intersectoral uh, that it can respond in different ways. And of course, we need resources and, and international financial institutions, international development institutions, and so on, need to start supporting uh, not just programs and agendas and gatekeeping. They just need to think seriously what gender-based durable solutions should look like to protect in ways that enable self-governance and autonomy. So I think I leave it there. Uh, I think I, 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 I put enough uh, claims, uh, but thank you very much. And, 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 and yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Rigorosi. Um, this was very informative and rich, and also for just highlighting how um, um, women are the drivers of forced migration now and that we need to have conversations around protection. And so I now turn it over to Elaine. Yeah. Hi. So, hello, everyone. Um, here I am again. And I have the distinct pleasure now of introducing our next speaker. A and she and she she is Gabrielle Casper. And now Gabriel is the president of the International Health Awareness Network, and this is the, the NGO that we partner with, the Institute for Women and Girls. They've been very, very involved in many conferences that we've done. Um, they've come in person as, as well as, as online. And so we've worked with Gabriel for, for many years. Um, another thing that, that she does, her real, her real job is she is the head of the medical school for uh, for gynecology and obstetrics women's medical school at at the University of Notre Dame in Sydney, Australia. Uh, but she really is a world traveler because she also is the past president of the Medical Women's International Association, which includes. Um, doctors, gynecologists from 
uh, from all over the world. She's been involved with the World Health Organization, as well as with the United Nations. She is a superb organizer. She carries her message everywhere. And I really enjoy this a partnership with her. And I really welcome her to our program. And she is going to present today with some of her students who are very involved in doing very interesting projects that help women and girls uh, in Australia, but elsewhere also. So let me turn the program over to you, Gabriel. Thank you, Elaine, for your very kind words. As you said, for many years, International Health Awareness Network has shared events with the Fordham Institute for Women and Girls. This really has been due to the friendship between Sandy Turner, Ilan Congress, and my mentor, Sarosh Rashan. For 39 years, International Health Awareness Network has actively advocated, educated, and assisted women across the globe. I would like to introduce Professors Lynn Madden and Megan Brennan. So please take your microphone off and your video back on. They have assisted me to appear for the event. Well, that's a bit of an understatement. They have put in an enormous effort and I'm extremely grateful to them for all their work. So could you just say hello, Lynn and Megan? Hi. And good morning. Great to be here with you and thank you for allowing us to join you. Thank you, Gabriel. And Megan? Yes, I'm here as well, really enjoying things so far. So thank you. So the backbone of the hard work is Lynn and Megan, but the people we're really going to hear for, from are the students. And really, women and girls are facing many health challenges across the globe exacerbated by climate, war, and COVID. These events are reversing decades of progress in women's and girls' health, especially for the world's poorest and most vulnerable women. Our presentations today are on monitoring and measuring women's health, major trends in women's health. I would like to ask the third year medical students at the University of Notre Dame to unmute uh, show us your face and say your name. Hi, I'm Lauren. Hi, I'm Emma. I'm Morgan. Hi, I'm Zoe. Oh, sorry, Zoe. Hi, I'm Lucy. We look forward to hearing your presentations. Thank you. Today, we will be outlining the global burden of disease and health trends for women with a focus on how they relate to the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. Mortality rates have steadily declined and life expectancy for women has increased from 69.3 years in 2000 to 75.9 years in 2019. And while women continue to have a higher life expectancy than men, they spend approximately 20% more of their lifetime living with poor health and disability compared to their male counterparts. Notably, the latest Global Burden of Disease study was in 2019 and the impacts of the COVID pandemic and recent environmental and humanitarian crisis are not represented in this data. This graph shows that from 1990 to 2019, there's been a significant shift in the burden of disease from communicable, maternal, neonatal and nutritional diseases to non-communicable diseases. In higher socio-demographic index regions, the burden of disease is primarily due to non-communicable diseases, such as ischemic heart disease, stroke, diabetes, and cancer. And in females compared to males, there's also a high burden of disease from back pain, musculoskeletal disorders, maternal and gynecological disorders, and anxiety disorders. Contrastingly, in regions with low socio-demographic index, the leading cause of death and disability remains communicable diseases, such as respiratory infections, diarrheal disease, and malaria, as well as neonatal conditions. However, the burden of non-communicable disease is increasing in these regions. But my colleagues will now outline how the continued burden of preventable maternal and nutritional diseases is prevalent across the globe. 
Looking now at the maternal mortality ratio as it relates to sustainable, sustainable development goal three, you'll note that we are currently not on track to reach the target of under 70 per 100,000 live births by 2030. Across the world, 233 women die per 100,000 live births, and this equates to approximately 850 women per day. Of these, 94% of these deaths are occurring in low and lower middle income countries, and progress must be made about six times faster in order to reach this goal. We're going to specifically look at one of our closest neighbours now, um, it's part of the Central and South, South Asia region, um, Bhutan, who's had quite a lot of success in reducing their maternal mortality ratio about 80% between the years 2000 to 2020. They've done this by a variety of measures, including societal measures, as noted here, increased pregnancy choice in terms of contraceptive prevalence, um, specific pre pregnant pregnancy care, 99% of births are now attended by a skilled professional and 85% of women had at least four antenatal care visits during their pregnancy. There are still some cha challenges when comparing rural to urban settings in Bhutan. We can also compare this to Australia. While Australia and New Zealand have the lowest rates of maternal mortality, of note is that the um, outcomes for Indigenous and non-Indigenous women are very different, with Indigenous women more 3.2 times more likely to die than non-Indigenous women while giving birth. Another large contributor to the global burden of disease um, for women is malnutrition, which encompasses a double burden of overnutrition or obesity as well as undernutrition. Globally, 1.9 billion adults are overweight or obese, while 462 million are underweight. Though widespread malnutrition has been a long-fought battle, now obesity and overnutrition contribute more to the global burden of disease. In 2016, 15% of women were obese compared with 11% of men, and the overweight and obesity prevalence among children and adolescents is also concerning rising from 4% in 1975 to just over 18% in 2016 for children aged 5 to 19. The same can be said when we look at undernutrition. There has been progress in reducing moderate to severe food insecurity, but we are far behind schedule to meet the second SDG of zero hunger by 2030. Without massive intervention, 23.5% of women and girls will be moderately or severely food insecure by 2030. So what's hindering our progress? Women's vulnerability to food insecurity largely comes down to gender inequity in agri-food systems. 49% of women in agriculture work as contributing family workers, receiving little to no pay, compared to only 17% of men. Women are also 50% less likely than men to have ownership or secure tenure rights over agricultural land. We cannot significantly progress on uneven ground. We need agricultural equity. Thanks for listening to us today. If you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to us. Hello, I'm Zandi, and today I'll be presenting alongside Tessa and Zoe. Today we'll examine the advancement of the 17 Sustainable Development Goals established by the United Nations, who aim to accomplish them by 2030. The UN state the SDGs are a blueprint to achieve a better and more sustainable future for all. As a collective, we have quite an interest in the health challenges faced by females. We recently participated in a, in a flagship program, Mission Manya, where women and girls were sadly disproportionately affected. This year, the International Health Awareness Network will prioritise enhancing the health of women and girls, which will be the focus of our presentation. The Sustainable Development Goals represent a global commitment to address the most pressing challenges facing our planet. Adopted by all United Nations member states in 2015, the goals provide a comprehensive framework to guide international efforts towards eradicating poverty, promoting social inclusion, and ensuring environmental and economic development. The SDGs acknowledge the interdependence of social, economic, and environmental factors. Achieving these goals requires an integrative, transformative shift in policies, practices, and mindsets at local, national, and global levels, with collaboration across borders and sectors. Three main SDGs for women and young girls are good health and well-being, gender equality and reduced inequalities. SDG 3 commits to ensuring healthy lives, addressing maternal and child mortality, infectious diseases, healthcare access and promoting good mental health. It aims to create a world with universal health coverage through preventative measures, treatment and care. By 2030, this looks like a global maternal, maternal mortality ratio reduction below 70 per 100,000 live births. 
Progress has halted since 2015 due to inequalities between regions of the world. Currently, Sub-Saharan Africa and Central Southern Asia have the highest level of maternal death risks, and progress in these regions must be six times faster to reach the global goal by 2030. Barriers leading to stagnancy in progress include obstetric resources available, staffing, transportation lack, and the inadequate health literacy of mothers to be aware of the dangers and signs during pregnancy or delivery. To work towards reducing this gap, we can evaluate the positive progress made by Nepal, who increased their healthcare investment, providing free maternity services, including education and enhanced access to skilled birth attendants. To restart the progress towards SDG 3, financial and policy reforms are needed. SDG 5 advocates for eliminating gender-based discrimination and violence and empowerment of women. Over 54% of countries lack laws preventing, uh, protecting women due to active resistance and underinvestment. This contrib contributes to underrepresentation and leadership, domestic violence and pay gaps. As we inch closer to 2030, global progress to achieving gender equality is quite frankly failing. None of the critical indicators are being met. Only two are close to target, eight are distant and eight lack data. In terms of violence, annually 245 million partnered females over the age of 15 are victims of physical or sexual violence by intimate partners. Despite progress, harmful practices including child marriage and female genital mutilation remain prevalent. To address the current arrest in progress, the following actions must be taken. Passing laws which up uphold gender equality, including domestic violence legislation, addressing the root causes of gender-based violence and improving access to support. SDG 10 aims to address disparities within and among countries, promoting social, economic and political inclusion. By narrowing gaps between privileged and marginalised populations, SDG 10 builds a more equitable world. SDG 10 was the worst performing goal in 2023. Women face greater discrimination based on sex, marital, HIV, migration and disability status than men. The progress of two sub-goals relating to migration and HIV highlights disproportionate discrimination against women and children. Despite more nations meeting criteria on migration policies, refugee numbers and death continually rise, where children make up 41% of refugee populations. Due to increased displacement in conflict zones, greater efforts must be made to prioritise safe migration. And although HIV prevention and treatment continues to improve, women living with HIV report in 26% of cases that receiving HIV treatment was conditional on taking contraception. Efforts must be made to improve legal services and train healthcare providers on human rights when treating women with HIV. We witnessed current women's health challenges in sub-Saharan Africa. Most commonly, we saw a large proportion of women and young children affected by STIs, including HIV, and domestic violence. We are currently halfway through the SDG agenda, yet the progress can't, simply can't keep up with the challenges our world faces. Lack of interest and investment from stakeholders necessitates a conscious effort to transition to women's empowerment, demanding global action to fulfill the 2030 agenda. Thanks very much for your time. Today, we will be discussing the social determinants of health and their role in trends in global maternal health. Maternal mortality has been a topic of discussion for many years as the interplay between medical care and the impact of the social determinants of health have determined the rise and fall of mortality rates. Maternal mortality is defined as any death during pregnancy, labour or the postpartum period and can be due to direct or indirect obstetric causes. Many maternal deaths are preventable and are caused by issues like untreated preeclampsia or hypertension in pregnancy, postpartum hemorrhage, iron deficiency anemia, sepsis and complications from cardiovascular disease. Maternal mortality is influenced by the super determinants of health. This is the interplay between the biosphere, the biological features of the human species, and economic, political, and cultural bases of society. The social determinants of health are the non biomedical factors that influence health risks and outcomes. Some of these social determinants, such as gender disparities, income, education, ethnicity, and race, have a strong influence on levels of maternal morbidity and mortality. These influence pregnant women's access to adequate antenatal care and intrapartum care. It influences their knowledge around the risks of pregnancy and childbirth, as well as their general access to health care.
in 2020, based on an analysis of 185 countries, the global maternal mortality ratio, or MMR, was on average 223 maternal deaths per 100,000 live births. That's roughly one maternal death every two minutes. From 2000, the MMR has steadily decreased up until 2016, when the reduction in maternal deaths from preventable causes either stagnated in the case of 133 countries or actually increased in the case of, of 17 countries across Western Europe, North America, Latin America, and the Caribbean. These general statistics don't highlight the nuances between regions and countries, however. There are substantial variations in maternal outcomes across the globe, particularly when comparing income groups given the impact financial stability has on access to good quality maternal care. For example, Sub-Saharan Africa holds the highest average MMR with 545 maternal deaths per 100,000 life births. Australia and New Zealand, both high-income countries, have the lowest MMR with four maternal deaths per 100,000 live births. The COVID-19 pandemic certainly had a multifaceted effect on maternal health outcomes, particularly in low-income countries. Both the infection of the virus itself, as well as reduced access to antenatal and birthing services throughout the pandemic, increased the risk of birthing complications like preeclampsia and postpartum hemorrhage. There's a clear need looking back on the past eight years, at particularly the post-pandemic, to reassess our progress in reducing maternal mortality globally. Currently, the world is not on track to meet Sustainable Development Goal 3.1, which is by 2030 to reduce the global maternal mortality ratio to less than 70 per 100,000 live births. The World Health Organization and the United Nations Population Fund launched these five clearly defined global and national targets to achieve by 2025 to help countries get back on track and reduce preventable maternal deaths and to enable monitoring of progress against the Sustainable Development Goals. Maternal mortality rates are linked to social determinants, which are controlled by multiple sectors. Consequently, the World Health Organization has recommended that in order to provide effective care, a collaborative approach between sectors is required. Examples of these sectors are the legal system, the water sanitation and hygiene system, and the education system. The interplay between sectors is demonstrated through evidence which has associated lower levels of education of women and girls with significantly increased risk of severe maternal outcomes, which include maternal mortality. When delivering interventions, the World Health Organization recommends a grounds-up approach that is individualized to the community it's targeting and is person-centered. One example of an organization whose work embodies this and the aforementioned new targets is FAME, the Foundation for African Medicine and Education. FAME services those living in rural Tanzania and its services are principally delivered by Tanzanians. Evidence has demonstrated that maternal health outcomes are improved by attending regular antenatal visits from early in pregnancy. FAME delivers a comprehensive prenatal program for a patient of a cost of only $2.25. The program includes four prenatal visits, two ultrasounds, essential lab tests, prenatal vitamins, health education, and any other necessary medical treatment. In 2022, there are 1,241 new enrollments in this program. Significant work is still required if we are to meet the UN Sustainable Development Goal by 2030. The work of FAME and other similarly holistic programs targeting social determinants are likely to be the most successful at improving maternal health outcomes, particularly preventable maternal mortality. Reaching this goal will require a continued multifaceted multi-sector approach, but ultimately the most influential factor will be incorporating the global work that is being done to understand social determinants into each lo unique local context to develop effective interventions. And these are our references. Oh, thank thank you. you very much. I'd like thank to um, acknowledge Dr. Aspen Tai and Dr. Mullen Sweeney Nash, who also assisted um, the students with their presentation, and Lara Curitas, who is our audiovisual technician. Students, thank you for your presentations. And for all of us, what can we do? It is important that NGOs and academic institutions continue to advocate 
educate and collaborate to assist women across the globe. On behalf of IHAN and the University of Notre Dame, Australia, I would like to thank Fordham for inviting us to participate in your conference. Thank you so much, Gabriel. I mean, you and your students are incredible. I mean, I can see why you're such a major leader in our world in terms of women's health issues. It's very impressive. And the work that you're doing on maternal mortality is really, really outstanding. So yeah, thank you so much. It's such an interesting presentation. And I'm sure people may have questions and comments in, in chat. Please feel free to put every put any questions you might have in chat because we hope to be able to, to discuss these questions later on. So th but thank you very much again. You okay? I have the honor of introducing our next speaker, also a Fordham alumni, Dr. Kamisha Grant, um, is the Vice President of Community Impact and Investment Bank for New York City. In her current role, Dr. Grant works to develop strategy partnerships and collaborations that impacts community across New York City, where 1.2 million New Yorkers struggle to afford food each year. Through Dr. Grant's creative and innovative leadership over the past 10 years, Food Bank for New York City has partnered with city-governed agencies, including the New York City Department of Probation and Administration for Children's Services, well as developed collaborations with hospitals, community health uh, centers, colleges, and universities. Before her work at Food um, a Bank, Food Bank for New York City, Dr. Grant spent 17 years with the New York City's Administration for Children's Services in various capacities, including child protection, uh, preventive services, data and research, policies and planning. Dr. Grant holds a, a BA from Virginia State of University. She earned a Master's of Social Work degree, well as her PhD in Social Work from Fordham University. There we are, it's coming off of mute. Thank you so much for that amazing introduction. And I am just gonna share my screen. So just let me know if you all can see it. Good. Okay. Awesome, great. Well, thank you. Thank you all for being here today. And uh, yes, I am a very proud Fordham alum. So today is a much, um, full circle moment for me. Uh, thank you, Dr. Congress, for having me. Certainly, we have a history together uh, while I was at Fordham, working on both my master's uh, degree as well as my PhD in social work. So very excited to be here to share um, a bit of what I'm doing now and to talk about this really important issue of food insecurity. So. Okay, so what we'll learn a little bit more about today is one, what is Food Bank for New York City? Um, and I'll share what we are, what we do uh, here in New York City to fight the issue of hunger. Um, I'll talk about women in financial poverty and share uh, what SNAP looks like and what that means for those who are struggling to afford food, um, income and population metrics. So really how the inequities are existing and what they look like for women here in New York City. Um, I'll talk about food insecurity and really define that and help to um, leverage an understanding of what that means when we talk about food insecurity. It's not just a buzzword. It certainly is something that is impacting a large number of people here in the city, particularly women. Uh, and then I'll wrap up with period poverty uh, and woman to woman, which is a campaign that Food Bank for New York City sponsors to really educate and bring awareness to the need uh, for period products for those who are low income and struggling with minimal resources. So Food Bank for New York City, who we are and what we do, we are the largest hunger relief organization here in New York City. Food Bank for New York City spans the five boroughs, and so we work across all of the city to provide emergency food to 1.2 billion, um, I'm sorry, 1.2 billion free meals to New Yorkers in need. We have been in existence for 40 years, and so that's a really long time when you think about the type of work that we do um, and really the impact that we have been able to make in the, in the past 40 years. 
the way that Food Bank for New York City works is that we partner with charities across the five boroughs. So there are over 800 partner organizations on the ground, and those include soup kitchens, food pantries, uh, campus pantries. We do have pantries in colleges and universities on campuses, um, as well as K through 12 schools. So over 800 charitable partners across the city who are providing this 1.2 billion free meals that I referenced above. Um, and then how do we do this work and where does this work happen? Well, we have uh, multiple locations. One is a 90,000 square foot warehouse that is in Hunt Point in the Bronx. And that's where all of our food is housed and stored. Um, and that's where our trucks are every morning loaded and then going out across the city to deliver food to New Yorkers in need. We also have a direct service arm, which is in West Harlem. Um, and there we produce 800 to 1,000 prepared meals daily. Uh, it's called a community kitchen. And um, we really are excited about the community feel that this location takes on because New Yorkers are able to come in, sit down, engage over a hot prepared meal with their neighbors, their children. Many of the families we serve live in shelters. Uh, many of the women are living in uh, domestic violence shelters and or situations. And so they're unable to actually cook at home. They're unable to prepare food um, for those who do have the resources to do so. Um, but for those who don't, they can still have a hot meal in our community community kitchen and pantry. So Food Bank for New York City, we do a lot more than just serve nutritious food to people. And that's one of the things that um, a lot of New Yorkers are not aware of. We provide over 900,000 pounds of household and personal care items to women and their families. So if you think about a New Yorker or anyone who is struggling to afford food, then you have to also think about how those non-food essentials will be impacted, right? If you are working off of a limited uh, income and you have minimal resources, it's, it's going to be very difficult for you to buy and afford many of the non-food essentials that your family needs. And so as you can see here, this is just a graph that breaks down by poundage what some of those items are that Food Bank for New York City is able to afford those New Yorkers who are struggling to afford food. Um, household goods, toys, books, and clothing, those are not going to be high on your priority list if you don't have enough money to afford food. And so Food Bank is able to come in and help support New Yorkers by providing those types of meals, um, sorry, those types of items, um, as well as some of the uh, items that you see, health and beauty aids, um, paper goods, which are really essential and important, as well as personal care, feminine hygiene products. And I'll talk more about those um, as we proceed through. In addition to the non-food essentials, Food Bank for New York City, we pride ourselves on our Food Plus programs. We know that anyone who is food insecure who shows up at one of our pantries will get a bag of food that will last them about three days, but we really are thoughtful and intentional about sustainability, about long-term opportunities to move people off of those pantry lines. We want to see families shopping in a supermarket. We want to see them cooking at home. And so the work that we do includes our free tax assistance program. And that is a program that's actually operating right now. We are in tax season. Um, Low-income New Yorkers that earn on average about $50,000 or less annually are able to have their taxes filed for free with Food Bank for New York City's partner agencies. Um, and that's one way that we're able to put buying power back into the communities. We're able to put money back into the pockets of low-income New Yorkers. We do not charge for this at all, and we do not keep any of the monies um, that would normally be going back into the pockets, again, of those who have done the work. SNAP assistance, and I'll get into SNAP a little bit more, which it really is the main uh, tool that New Yorkers who are who are struggling to afford food um, utilize to shop in a supermarket. So again, Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program is what SNAP stands for, um, also known as food stamps in the past. So some people may be more familiar with that term, but it really is the opportunity to ensure that New Yorkers um, that we serve are in the supermarket shopping. And so Food Bank for New York City, we train our partners to be able to screen for SNAP eligibility, as well as complete applications for SNAP um, directly on site. So if you go into any one of our pantries, you're able to actually have a screening and complete an application. So again, a very um, necessary and important way that we are able to think about sustainability and longer term goals. Financial empowerment and education. 
super important to us at Food Bank for New York City. If you are working and you are uh, receiving a, a low income, low wages, we want to make sure that you are very thoughtful about how to manage your funds. Um, so we are training and educating New Yorkers on things like budgeting, um, savings, helping people set up bank accounts. And so again, really being intentional about ways that we think about sustainability, um, as well as nutrition education. Nutrition education is so key uh, at Food Bank for New York City. We are not only giving people food, but we're giving people healthy, nutritious foods that do not make them sick. We are uh, giving people foods that really connect to who they are culturally. Uh, what are those cultural preferences that they have? Um, if there are allergies, we certainly want to be thoughtful about the types of foods that we are providing to one's family members because we want to make sure uh, that they are certainly able to consume it. Um, and then when you go into a pantry, we, we want to make sure that you're educated on the various types of produce. You may encounter uh, a rutabaga, just as an example, a type of pr a produce that you're not familiar with. We want to, one, educate you on what it is. We want to provide you with a recipe recipe so that you know how to prepare it at home. And what does that do? Well, that makes it typically more likely for you to actually select that item and take it home for your family. So let's get a little bit into food insecurity and what we mean at Food Bank for New York City when we talk about food insecurity. And it really is referring to a lack of available financial resources for food for the entire household. Um, and so we want to make sure that people who are, that food insecurity is understood as having access by all people at all times to afford enough food. And there's a, a huge difference between food insecurity and hunger, right? And so I think we all have felt that sensate, that feeling of, of hunger, um, but when you are hungry and you don't have the means and or the resources to afford food, then that's where it shifts to that food insecurity. That's where you cross the line into uh, food insecurity. So just a few stats that I wanted to share, and I want to really um, impress upon you the impact of this issue in our city um, and what that looks like in relation to uh, the United States. So you'll see here just the numbers, 30.3% or more than 3 million households headed by single mother, single women were food insecure in 2022, right? And so that's a huge number. Um, and then you'll see for New York State, nearly 1.5 million women are considered living below the federal poverty level. Um, and so if you are living below the federal poverty level, how are you going to have the resources to be able to afford enough food for your family? Um, and that is a real challenge that we're seeing in our city. Women in financial poverty. So again, really I wanted to lay out what this looks like across the United States, in New York State, and then in New York City. Um, and, and underbelly, sort of what really is um, at the very forefront of food insecurity is poverty, right? What we understand and know uh, is that in the U.S., poverty threshold is approximately $21,960. Um, and if you look at what that looks like in the percentage of women who are living below that poverty line, it's staggering. Um, in New York City alone, almost 20%. Uh, compared to, you know, you, I'm sorry, compared to New York State, which is at 15.2, um, and then across the United States, 13.8. So I started to talk a little bit about SNAP earlier, so we'll get into that again, um, just so that you have a, a more thorough understanding um, about SNAP. And one of the things that you want to understand about SNAP is that while there are large percentages, as you can see here, of women-led households, that are receiving this benefit, there is a significant group of eligible women who are not receiving the benefit. And that and that is concerning. We want to make sure at Food Bank for New York City that we are identifying those women and those head of households who are eligible for this benefit, but are, but are not yet connected. And so that's a big part of the work that we're doing to make sure that if you meet the eligibility criteria, that we can help support you to be connected to SNAP. Nearly 5.3 million female householders with no spouse rely on SNAP benefits. And so again, a very um, significant number uh, of women led households. And what does that look like across the United States, New York State, and then New York City? Well, you see the numbers here, um, very staggering, very high numbers. 32.7% of female led households are relying on SNAP across the United States and in New York City, 31.8%. 
Um, and so these numbers, again, directly align with what we're seeing around food insecurity in our city. Women in New York City make up, as you see here, 62% of the population in the state that rely on SNAP benefits. Um, large number of women are leading households. Women are making very difficult decisions when they have minimal resources, right? And what that looks like is a mom, and this is a very true story, an example, a mom who may not eat dinner if her children finish what's on their plates. And we are seeing that happen every day here in our city. Moms are feeding their children first. They're feeding their pets. We see a lot of seniors who are making decisions between feeding their pets and themselves. Um, a lot of women are making those decisions because they don't have adequate resources. Um, and the only way that mom may eat dinner that night is if the children don't eat all of the food that they have on their plates. And so um, just really devastating to think about that here in our city, but it does exist. I also wanted to highlight uh, income and population and just share some numbers here, again, relative to women um, across the United States, New York State and New York City. Uh, and so you can see here that more than 4.3 million women live in New York City and the estimated median, median income for single mothers is only $35,935. So just think about that number and, and think about how that would certainly become a barrier for um, someone who is paying rent, uh, paying for child care in many, in many instances, taking care of family members, um, buying non-food items, clothing items, essential um, items for their families. You can see that this income is just insufficient and certainly not enough. And this is what we're seeing across the state and also across uh, the United States when we think about where women land on the income uh, scale. I also wanted to talk a little bit about period poverty uh, and Woman to Woman, which is a campaign that Food Bank for New York City leads to ensure that people are educated um, and have an understanding and a level of awareness around period poverty. And so what is period poverty? Period poverty is really the lack of accessibility or affordability for menstrual hygiene tools and educational material. So that looks like sanitary products, menstrual health and hygiene management resources. And what we see at Food Bank for New York City is that when girls are not able to afford and access these products, they're missing school. Um, and so that begins to impact their education and their learning. And so um, they're staying at home for one week out of the month, every month. Uh, and so if you think about that multiplication um, of nine months of school a year, how far behind that starts to set, to put them in the academic sphere. We are also uh, seeing uh, more often that um, just tied to women and also tied to girls who are experiencing this issue. One of the ways that Food Bank for New York City is uh, really working to make sure that these items are stocked in, in um uh, and are available is through our campus pantries. Uh, and I started to talk a little bit about our campus pantries earlier on, but Food Bank for New York City, we are in over 50 K through 12 public schools across New York City. And our campus pantries are where young people can access these items for free. In addition to uh, these period items, we're also providing deodorant and other personal care items that really help young women and young girls be able to go to school because we want to make sure that they are able to be um, in school the entire month. And so this is a big issue that we're also seeing at Food Bank for New York City. We do a lot of work uh, annually to campaign for resources and support to continuously be able to purchase these items. And so our uh, amazing board member, Katie Lee Beagle was super instrumental in helping us kick off what we call our woman to woman campaign. And again, that raises awareness, but also brings money for period products um, and essential household items. And so we've been very successful uh, in this campaign as well. And here's just, uh, you know, something to think about, period products, hygiene essentials, um, even baby care items. These are all very expensive. And when I talked about SNAP earlier, um, SNAP only is only 
uh, a resource that you can use for food. It is not a resource that you can use to buy any of these items. It only allows you to purchase food. And again, all of these other items um, for low income New Yorkers are very expensive. It's expensive to afford. And so um, women shouldn't have to choose between groceries and tampons, yet we're seeing those decisions being made every day here in our city. So I, I wanted to just leave a, leave you with a few thoughts about food insecurity um, and ways that you all can get involved. Um, the first is food insecurity is often hidden in plain sight. And I think, you know, we're still seeing this, this, um, this misconception that typically people who are food insecure are homeless, and that is not the case. There are working New Yorkers uh, who are on our lines. There are college students who are on our lines. There are the credentialed, um, you know, highly educated people who perhaps have lost a job or have been laid off that are joining our lines. And so you never know who might be struggling. Um, and for some people, it's a, a short term. And for some people, they have been struggling for um, for years and they're just really working very diligently to bring themselves out um, of uh, the space that they're in. And Food Bank for New York City continuously supports them. Societal shame is often a barrier to seeking help. Um, many of you have probably seen the very long lines uh, at in your in your neighborhoods that lead and extend from a pantry where people are showing up and they're getting online um, and they're waiting to get food. And it's uh, it, it's not a great feeling to have to ask for food. It's not a great feeling to have to stand in line and wait for food. And so um, dignity is one of the ways that Food Bank for New York City has worked very diligently to move people off of the lines. We've used technology. Um, we've worked to create online pantry opportunities where you can actually shop for pantry items and groceries online and then come in just to pick those bags up and there's no wait. And so we're really thoughtful and intentional about ways to minimize and, and ultimately reduce that chain. Um, because what we don't want is people to not show up. When they don't show up, they don't get what they need. And that is um, one of the things that we want to prevent. Um, and then lastly here, everyone can get involved in the fight to end food insecurity. There are ways that everyone can help support women um, who are facing this issue. At Food Bank for New York City, there are probably three buckets that I would put this in. One is volunteer. You can uh, sign up on our website for volunteer opportunities to come in and help us with packing and storage um, and handling of food items and also the distribution of those items. Um, another way is to donate. Uh, what a lot of people don't know is $1 affords uh, us the opportunity to buy five meals for a New Yorker in need. And so there's no amount that's too small. Just $1 equates to five meals purchased. Um, and then I, I'd say the last way is really to advocate and just raise your voice, write to lo your local elected officials about this issue, elevating the issue, keeping it at the forefront of electeds um, so that we can get additional funding and additional support to continue in this fight. Uh, and that's all I have. So thank you so much for your time and for listening. Um, thank you, Dr. Grant, for such a resourceful presentation. And I'm pretty sure a lot of us can pass uh, the utilize these resources as well as pass it to our clients. And uh, Elaine Congress will introduce our next speaker. Okay, yes, uh, thank you. Uh, yes, well, we've been around the world today, haven't we? I mean, it's, it's South Africa. Uh, then we've done uh, we've done England we've we've done uh, South South America we've uh, uh, we've done Australia and uh, we've uh, now we're kind of back here <laughs> in, in in the Northeast and we've we've done uh, uh, New York but now we're really coming home to Florida <laughs> and I have the distinct pleasure of introducing Dr. Julie Daphne. And she is the uh, Assistant Vice President for Strategic Mission Initiatives at Florida. And I'm gonna talk about one of the most exciting projects that she's doing right now. She, she's serving as, as the uh, uh, Director of the Community um, pro, pro, um, Lead and Principal Investigator in Region 2. And she was awarded $50 million to give to 
uh, NGOs that are really working on projects that will advance um, environmental justice. And uh, this is really a, you know, a big deal. And we talk all the time about we have small actions that are going to have huge solutions. And so she's really in a, in a, in a very important uh, position to, to, to you know, help uh, make decisions about this. So, and she, I was very in, involved in making Ford, Fordham green and um, maybe she'll talk to us about some of these projects. But without um, further ado, let me just move the program over to Dr. Gaffney. And thanks so much for j joining us. Of course. No, thanks so much for having me. And such a pleasure to be with you today um, and to talk a little bit about this project. So, um, yeah, I'm going to I'm going to maybe a little bit different than some of the other presenters and so exciting to hear about all of their local and global initiatives. Um, I'm really going to talk about this project specifically and um, and and use it as a case study to um, to talk a little bit about uh, climate displacement and um, and gender and then to look at um, how we can employ an asset based community solution, um, how community solution building can uh, intersect with um, with public policy solutions. Um, to really support frontline communities in leading environmental justice efforts. Um, so I want to start by sharing information that I'm sure folks on here already have, but it's worth repeating that um, right now about 130 million people are displaced by climate change and 80% of them are women and children. Um, and as we know, when women are displaced, they are at greater risk. One of the other uh, presenters was talking about this of violence, including sexual violence. There's a loss of autonomy that comes with um, forced displacement. Um, and often we find among all people who are displaced by climate stressors and by environmental stressors, and that number goes up if we're looking at broader environmental justice, environmental stressors, that people are displaced from one severely climate impacted location to another. So if we think, for instance, about I do my community work here in the Bronx in, in New York City um, and work really closely with the Garifuna community. We've got uh, 250,000 members of the Garifuna community living in the Bronx, uh, many of whom were displaced um, from Honduras, uh, which is now uh, one of many displacements that the Garifuna people have, um, have undergone because of changes in the coastline, because of a lack of um, economic opportunity related to agriculture, to fishing, um, to some of the other opportunities. And then folks are moving to the Bronx where we're seeing some of the highest child asthma rates, where we're seeing lack of, just as there was lack of access to coastline because of coastal erosion in Honduras, we're seeing lack of access to waterways and to green spaces because of insidious city planning in the Bronx. So when we're talking about climate displacement, we're talking another you know group of people we could think about is um, Puerto Rican migration, where we have um, Puerto Rico that has some of the highest asthma rates in the world, and then many Puerto Rican people migrating to New York for economic opportunity, living in the Bronx. Again, some of the highest child asthma rates in the nation due to pollution from the Crash Bronx Expressway and other thoroughfares and other. Um, environmental issues. So it's not to say I want to take a cue from one of the one of the earlier presenters um, who urges us not to just beat the drum of what's going wrong. But I do want to start with these facts because they're sobering. And I think we have to look with clear eyes at what's going on in order to craft the most effective solutions. Um, and so where this project came from, this $50 million project, you know, it's kind of an amazing opportunity. It's an amazing opportunity for Fordham. It's a great opportunity to have the Bronx leading a frontline community initiative to support grassroots organizations, nonprofits, and NGOs, Indian nations, local municipalities with federal funding for their own um, community led environmental justice initiatives. Um, and this comes out of the Inflation Reduction Act and the Justice 40 legislation. Um, so the Inflation Reduction Act is generating a lot of, of money over these years, um, and, and much of it is being directed to mitigate the insidious effects of climate change. Um, and part of the way that, that the current administration has chosen to direct this funding is through the Justice 40 legislation, which basically dictates that 40% of those funds need to go to 
individuals, communities, organizations that are frontline that have been disproportionately impacted by climate and environmental um, crises. Um, and so in order to do that, basically, like what they did with this amount of funding is they gave it to the EPA to say, you need to develop um, a program or a set of programs to direct federal funding to community organizations. And as I'm sure most folks on here know who have applied for federal funding, one of the biggest barriers to applying for and then receiving federal funding is that the process is really lengthy. It's really complex. Um, and then at the end, there's not there's no check. Often it's a reimbursement model. So if we're thinking about grassroots organizations that have five employees, 10 employees, even 50 employees, um, having the capacity to be able to sift through 30 pages of instructions, a 60 page application, then to get through and have to take on the compliance burden. If you don't have a compliance department, you don't have a finance department. Um, on top of which you might be receiving funding through a reimbursement model. So you might be getting money that you have to have in your account. You have to spend it and submit for, for reimbursement. This has made it really kind of a non-starter for many organizations to be able to apply for smaller amounts of federal funding and larger amounts of federal funding. So it has really impeded um, the federal government in this particular area in climate um, and environmental justice to getting funding to the organizations that we all that we know are doing the work that we know are actually leading the local solutions that are going to make meaningful change for people, you know, this year, next year, um, in the short term, because we don't have decades here on this issue, we need to be making change in real time. Um, so I think it's actually it's really exciting. It's a kind of experimental project that the EPA has designated 11 regional grant makers throughout the nation, basically to absorb some of that burden of compliance, not all of it. <laughs> We're going to have to work closely with our subgrant recipients, but to be able to employ. And this is where I think, you know, I had labeled my talk something about the, the intersection of climate justice and higher education. This is where I think that universities and colleges can actually reimagine um, what we do because we do function like little cities, right? Fordham is a community of 30,000 people, 15,000 of them are employees. We have a finance department, we have a compliance department, we have many, many educators who are employing their um, teaching, learning, and research agendas to advance um, against some of the most urgent issues that are pressing our city who are incorporating student praxis into uh, into the curriculum. I know for GSS, for most students, that's a requirement. So, um, But even for the undergraduate curriculum, one of the things I've been leading over the last five years is incorporating praxis experiences and capacity building for local organizations into the undergraduate student curriculum so that when you take a core course, sure, you're going to get your um, literature, you're going to get your econ, you're going to get your STEM course, but you're also mobilizing the skills you're learning in the classroom alongside the community leaders that are really leading the key solutions. Um, so what we did here, and I'm really delighted that we were successful, is put together an application that centers community organizations. The decisions for the subgrants will not be made by Fordham employees. They will not be made by me. They'll be made by a group of community leaders who have been doing the EJ work on the ground for decades. Um, but it utilizes Fordham's infrastructure to be able to smoothly process those awards, to be able to um, offer a mixed model so that organizations that receive funding um, can get a portion of it up front so that they can start their activities. And then as they demonstrate that they're moving through the process, they receive more and more funding. Um, to be able to structure with the help of students, faculty members, and community organizations, info sessions, application workshops, um, to be able to offer compliance support. Um, so one of the things that we wrote into the grant is that each subgrant, and I'll talk a little bit more about the specifics toward the end so that if anyone on here, or if you have any contacts that are interested in applying for this funding, you, you'll know a little bit more about them. But for each award that we're offering, um, we're building in a community of practice so that every organization that receives funding doesn't just receive the funding and maybe some training, they also receive a community leader mentor that they're paired with to support them um, with community connections, with experience in the field. 
They receive a faculty advisor to support with any research deliverables um, and to support with best practices in the field. And then they receive the support of two graduate students, um, one who is supporting with uh, program operations and administration and one who's supporting with evaluation and assessment. So you you get a little staff, you get a little team um, going along with this project because the big goal really is to get federal funding to organizations that have not typically received that funding before. Um, and this is going to be very much hand in hand with the community organizations to say, what would you be interested in? You know, we're not going to sort of assign folks, um, but like, what would you be interested in? If you could hire somebody new, um, if you could collaborate with a faculty member, you know, what would the area of expertise be? And of course, we want to utilize Fordham, but we also have um, about 10 partners throughout the region. So we'll be supporting all of region two with this grant making initiative, um, New York, New Jersey. Puerto Rico and the US Virgin Islands. So we have partners on the ground. We're working with University of Puerto Rico, with Sagrado Corazon, with NJIT, with Rowan, um, with all of the AJCU institutions in the area, of course, our uh, brother and sister organizations and institutions. Um, so it's to me, you know, and, and I'm really in it day to day. Today was actually a deadline for EPA for getting in our updated work plan and budget. So I've done that. I can celebrate with you all now. Um, but it really is a moment to be thinking about, like you look at the Justice 40 legislation on paper and the way that it directs, it describes this vision of directing funds. And then this is one of the very first actual articulations of how we're trying to put that legislation into practice. Um, and I want to just highlight because of the topic today, the um, one of the central pieces of our strategy, and that is working with, so we're working not only with community leaders who are going to be making those grant selections, we're also working with five nonprofits who are going to be contracted statutory partners with us, who will be responsible for supporting outreach, making sure that community organizations throughout the region know about the opportunities, supporting with info sessions, with multilingual application materials, with application workshops, um, plugging in technical assistance, which is going to come from other EPA supported um, organizations, the technical assistance hubs, and then also supporting with project management once the funds have been um, have been distributed and the projects are funded. Um, and our two organizations that we work that we're working with in New York and New Jersey are the um, New York Immigration Coalition and the New Jersey Alliance for Immigrant Justice. And the reason for this is uh, we have a couple a number of reasons, but it really speaks to kind of what we're here for today. Um, one is that first and foremost, we are honoring that many people who are have, have experienced displacement and migration have been doubly impacted by climate and environmental stressors. So we want to start, we're talking about frontline communities, we want to start um, with that knowledge in mind. Um, the second is that these are both umbrella organizations that have as members many environmental justice organizations, but that also have many other organizations that do intersectional social service and advocacy work. Um, and so they're going to be really key messengers to helping us get out the word about this, because I bet if anybody here, you know, before this call, you're, if you heard EPA, you're probably thinking cleanups, you're probably thinking access to green spaces, you're probably thinking about, um, you know, some of the kind of corrective measures that they're taking to to make sure that industry and other actors are, are not um, going beyond, you know, I, it's terrible to put it this way, but like quotas for pollution, right? Um, this is a totally different activity that EPA is taking on. And it's this funding is not only available to organizations that consider themselves environmental justice organizations, it's available to a housing organization that is taking on, that's retrofitting a community center to be carbon neutral. It's available to um, a school that is working on a workforce development initiative um, to pair graduating seniors into, you know, emerging jobs in the green economy for education pipeline programs, um, for clean energy transitions, for sustainable agriculture, food systems, and foodways. And so if we're working with experts in migration justice and advocacy, that means we're also working with experts in inter an intersectional approach to environmental justice. Um, and then we're also working with uh, organizations and individuals that have um, 
tremendous language expertise. We have committed to making our applications available in the 15 most commonly spoken languages throughout Region 2. Um, and to being able to offer all of our application and workshops and info sessions with um, translation and interpretation services so that we're not leaving out any organizations or individuals who want to be able to apply. Um, and so when we're thinking about an asset based approach, we're really um, working with our partners in um, NYIC and um, and in New Jersey to um, to be able to access all of the frontline communities in region to not only those that consider themselves EJ and not only those um, who who speak English um, and, and of course in Puerto Rico that's a, a an additional um, piece of the of the strategy that we do need to be sure everything is completely bilingual. Um, our website that's already up and I'll put that into the chat is is fully bilingual um, and all of our materials will be available in English and Spanish. Um, so I'll, I'll close. I know I'm running out of time just quickly with a sense of the opportunities that are available. So we'll be opening the application in June and applications will be open for three years and we'll be accepting applications on a rolling basis. Um, I shared with you some of the different opportunities for funding. We're really casting a wide net for environmental justice initiatives. And the awards are available in four amounts, in $75,000, $150,000, $250,000, and $350,000 for organizations in Region 2. And the funding is based on where you are with the project. The $75,000 are fixed amount, non-competitive awards, so you don't even need to submit an application for those, those are intended for capacity constrained organizations that really need an infusion of cash to keep doing their work. Um, and that's a new structure EPA is piloting. I think it's brilliant. I'm already working separately to fundraise to grow a larger NYC um, grant for, for that kind of bucket uh, of funding. Cause I just, I really love the model. The other three are competitive awards. So you, there'll be a call for proposals and, um, and applications to submit. Um, the 150s are for getting a feel for the project. They're primarily research-based, so conducting a needs assessment if you want to do an air quality monitoring project, something like that. The 250, you have the data for the, for the project, um, but you need to build capacity. You need to get community buy-in. Um, so those are kind of capacity building and scaling. And then the 350s are shovel ready. You've got a program and you just want to expand it. You've already done the work. You've got the partners. You're ready to launch um, an infrastructure project. Um, so there's a really wide range of opportunities. And I would love to hear from anybody um, who is interested or who can um, connect me with any of any eligible subgrant recipients because these next few months we're really going to be pushing to get the word out about this opportunity, um, connecting folks with resources, and then we do plan to make the first set of awards in August. Um, so it's a really good time. Uh, there has never been this is unprecedented funding coming out of the federal government for environmental justice, um, and so we feel a tremendous sense of responsibility to live up to that the promise enshrined in that legislation. Um, and yeah, I would love to do it in collaboration with you. Great. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Dr. Gaffney. It's I mean and what you, you talk about is so important. And this shows, I mean, it's really small actions that can lead you <laughs> solutions. Because um, you know, this really is how we can make it happen and 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 reinforce people have small projects really have a big effect. And so I think it's really fitting that we end that your that we end with your presentation about how to really make this a solution. Um and, and instead of just, you know, and I think it's important that we kind of know, you know, problems that we have, but this is very helpful in terms of leading us to to future solutions. Um so now I don't know how much time we have for uh for questions. Um, and, Can I just you know, jump in um, before we start with the question and answers, please? Sure. I, we, um, in terms of the anybody who wants to get CE credit, in case you have to leave, um, you know, right on time, the evaluation is now in the chat. Um, Kristen Tregler has put it in. Thank you so much. So please fill out the evaluation if you want CE credits. It's two credits, and you can email it to me, S. Turner at Fordham.edu, and I'll um, take care to make sure that, that you get it, okay? Thank you so much. Okay, thanks. Um, I, 
I know we don't have much time, but we do have a few questions in the chat. So the first, I think we'll go directly to Dr. Um, Pia. Um, with food, healthcare, and violence as drivers of migration, are there data on older women who cannot or do not have, do not leave their subsequent experience with these drivers? That, that, thank you very much. That, uh, what a session. I, I am so impressed with everything and all the, the uh, presentations today. So thanks for, for making me part of this. Uh, this is a great question. And, and of course, I'm working with migrant women that are in transit uh, as they leave Venezuela and, and continue uh, to South American countries and now particularly to, uh, through Central America. Those who remain, I mean, we know that in Venezuela at the moment, uh, there's a, a UN report that just came out uh, that shows that 82% of the population live in, po in poverty and that 53% are in extreme poverty. So these are, um, it, these are worrying um, uh, uh, percentages and the population that stay, and rightly so, the question points out the demographic change in, in the country, because most of those who live are um, within the, the, the bracket of uh, uh, young, uh, and for, for women and girls, are uh, uh, young girls uh, uh, and girls uh, and women uh, uh, in relative age, that's kind of the prevalent age living in terms of women, but also uh, men and and those who stay who are the uh, elderly or those who stay in separated families or truncated families and some uh, stay for caring um, purposes, they receive remittances. So remittances is a massive thing at, uh, that is supporting uh, those who stay. Uh, so this is a question. Now, there were many things related to the presentations that we just heard and uh, as well, because uh, there is a, a trend that is increasing and that is uh, extremely worrying um, of uh, um, Venezuelan people living through the Darien and crossing the Darien gap and the accumulation of food insecurity uh especially and uh, to the question of what you need to continue your journey as they're crossing seven countries to get to the us um goes from at first is, is clothing and, and shoes but then goes increasingly into food and medicines so you can see the deterioration of those who are in transit and and of course those who stay uh, live out of uh, remittances so uh, big, big, big question marks for 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 protection and for human rights of of of, of people in general. Thank you. Uh, next, Dr. Grant, there is a question for you. It says, while New York City Department for the Aging provides home delivered meals for older persons, what percentage percentage of older persons using the services of food bank? Yes, thank you for that question. So, food bank for New York City, we partner very closely with the Department for the Aging. Um, they do provide prepared meals, um, and those typically are going to homebound seniors. But you have a lot of um, elders who are still able to come out. They want to have um, companionship, and they want to be in a community space because at home they are lonely. And so we do see them in our senior center. Um, of the elders in, the, in New York City, we are serving probably one out of every six, um, in either in one of our elder centers and or through our senior grocery program. Uh, the, excuse me, the senior grocery program allows them to be able to take home bags of groceries that they can then use to prepare their own foods versus the diff to meal, diff to meals, which are typically prepared um, and then distributed to them. And so it's a great question. Um, seniors are really at the top of our list in terms of prioritizing. We also see a large number of veterans who are typically also seniors and they've returned home uh, from a war. They do not have adequate resources. They don't have a, a, enough food and they too are on our lines and we are serving them as well. The next question from Christian White. Uh, you mentioned that also for Dr. Grant, you mentioned that food bank provide hot food for those in shelters who might not have access to kitchens what are other ways you make these meals accessible, equitable for those in need? Absolutely. So 
Food Bank for New York City, you attest to need by showing up. So any one of our pantries, and I talked about these over 800 pantries and soup kitchens across the city, if you show up and join the line, that is how you attest to need. There are no questions asked. You are eligible and able to uh, participate in our programming. And that means that you can take grocery items, you can um, participate in the hot meal service. There are typically for the pantry where you'll shop for groceries. There are a couple of questions that you might be asked. One is what's the size of your family? Because if you have a household of five uh, and another person has a household of two, we wanna make sure that we give you more food. Um, and so that really is sort of the basic question that we'll ask you, but you are not asked for income. There, there are no eligibility criteria. You attest to need by showing up. And so in addition to, you know, just the example that I made about shelters, anybody, in our city who is hungry can go to any one of our local um, organizations and they can get food and services. Mm -hmm. So yeah, you definitely don't ask about immigration status, of course. Absolutely not. Absolutely not. You just, you show up and you will be able to get what you need. And in fact, thank you, uh, uh, Dr. Congress, for that. What we are seeing is that our pantries are really a hub. They're becoming our pantry leaders or trusted partners in the community. They are helping to field immigration questions. They are doing so much beyond food. Um, they are working with advocacy, uh, legal services. I mean, they are helping people get basic ID, take the steps to just get identification, uh, clothing, as I mentioned, all of these other resources. And so they are well beyond pantries and doing a lot of work. Okay. Right. Thank you. All right. So the next I don't know if there was another this, question. I'm sorry. And I know we're out of time. I, just, I, I know we're trying to go through, um, but I think this one's for the students. Okay. Uh, um, could you, would you please repeat the multiple systems that need to be work together for an, in order to be more effectively help um, address health issues as presented today? Any of the students present? Oh, which that was a good question for one of Gabriel's students. For, yeah, for um, I think that that was directed at me. Um, so it was talking about multiple systems into playing like the education system, the political system, and the sanitation system. So they're just some of many, but it's essentially all entities that can be influenced um, at multiple levels, but especially from our government levels that need to be included. Um, in order to comprehensively address um, these targets. Yeah, and I think that's a more important message for us all, you know, to work together with other systems to, you know, try to make the world better to address, uh, you know, gender issues. Okay, so I think we covered all the questions from the chat. I am not sure if anyone has their hand up for any to ask any questions, I can't see. Well, we I, think, I, think, I think that's about it. Uh, so, about well, it. Th okay. yeah. Thank you. Um, thank you very much for coming. Um, I, I think it was just a very interesting conference. I, I know I learned a lot. Um, if you think of a question afterwards and you'd like to get in touch with one of our speakers, um, I, you may you know have their uh, email, but if you don't, please contact me and I can share it with you. And I really um, I'm glad that you could participate. Sandy, do you want? Yeah, I want to thank you all for, for coming. I think this is one of our best ever conferences. It's the first time we've had actually more people at the end than in the beginning. Right. And, I know that's um, a thought. And we're really at least every single speaker I think was was absolutely fantastic. Yeah. Um, you know, I'm leaving with a lot of ideas for small small actions and and uh, big solutions so thank you all so much and give um, everyone their homework assignment remember no. and before we leave i'd like liliana to just talk a little bit about our little newsletter project from um our autumn institute hi uh thank you um very quickly my name is liliana espinosa i have the honor of being the editor of the fordan institute women and girls newsletter 2024 edition uh, i just want to share the latest version of the newsletter which was recently published and i leave the link in for the newsletter in the chat if you want to take a look uh, on the front page, you will read an interview with the Fordham presidents. We want to highlight women's in leadership position, and she's the first woman to be the president of this institution. 
then you can find two articles about the two parallel events that were organized with the, S the uh, status of women in the UN committee. Uh, the third part is about articles for our conference in, U in November for closing the digital gap. Um, and the fourth part are articles for uh, students and their advocacy projects. And the fifth and final session is about um, the um, Women's Institute um, partnership that they have with uh, the UN and the international NGO and um, an article about gender equality and maternal health. Uh, please take a look and share it with others and help us to spread the newsletter. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks, yeah, everyone. So, and now the whole, our, your homework assignment going forth. You know, I feel it, it shouldn't just be you with your great conference, you have great ideas, but everyone has a little homework assignment in terms of a small step, what they can do that will lead to a huge solution. So I, I mean, you know, I'm a teacher, so I'm going to leave you all, since Sandy is also, and we're going to leave you all with the, you know, homework assignments to think about, you know, what you, you know, what you've learned today and what you can do, a small action that can lead to a major solution to address women's, uh, you know, poverty for women and girls and everyone. In fact, you. Elaine, you holding this meeting, a two-hour meeting, is an, a small step, but it can have enormous outcomes as everyone walks away hearing all about the issues and trying to work out how we can collaborate. So you've already done your small step. You, oh, yeah, okay. small. Anyway, you organized the conference. <laughs> okay, thanks. But, it, but it's never ending. We can always think of other small steps that we can make that would make a big difference. So, well, thank you. Stay, stay tuned for our next a activity. I'm sure we'll be we'll be doing a conference in the fall. But in the in the interim, I think that we'll probably be communicating with you. And I'm so glad that you could come and participate with us today. Bye, everyone. Thanks. Bye.